Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Senior Welcome. Registrar Forum of Lanka College of Internal Medicine uh, for the month of July. And the Senior Registrar Forum is a brainchild of our immediate past president, Dr. Ganakasena Ratna. We had uh, several Senior Registrar Forums from last year. And this year, last two months, we had physical meetings. And we are back to the virtual meetings from this month. Uh, without much delay, uh, may I invite our president, Dr. Kumudani Jai Singh, uh, to address the forum. Dr. Kumudani, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Primali. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Intermedicine, uh, uh, I, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone, uh, all my fellow colleagues, uh, our senior registrars and other doctors to this uh, SLCMSR forum. And uh, I would like to extend a special welcome and appreciate the speaker today, Dr. Tushar Hivagigana, consultant chemical pathologist, uh, who is sharing his, uh, his expertise today. Uh, this very important uh, topic, which is actually very, uh, will be very useful for all the categories of doctors uh, who are practicing clinical medicine. Uh, uh, the last but not least, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Priya Malija Sekar, our honorary treasurer, who is uh, passionately leading the SR Forum, and uh, Dr. Ganakasena Ratna, our immediate past president, uh, for establishing this forum to help our future internists uh, to become more competent uh, internists. Uh, without further ado, uh, I invite all to witness this very important uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kumudoni. And uh, this today topic is pre-analytical errors, pitfalls in the interpretation of biochemical reports. Uh, so as Dr. Kumudoni said, it's very important all of us to know this because when we sometimes we are in uh, um, difficult situations when we are going to analyze the report. So today we have uh, an expert on that. He's uh, Dr. Tushar Heva Gigana consultant chemical pathologist and who is a president elect for college of chemical pathologist so without delay may i invite dr tushara hevagigana for his talk over to you tushara thank you uh, dr priyamali for that introduction uh first of all let me thank uh, the college of uh, internal medicine sri lanka for giving uh, this opportunity to me uh as uh, previously mentioned, I'm going to talk to you on pre-analytical errors, pitfalls in the interpretation of biochemical reports. So in this lecture, I will be talking about uh, what pre-analytical phase is. And I'll be talking about pre-analytical errors and the causative mechanism. Also, I'll be uh, briefly elaborate on uh, laboratory techniques so that you can understand how the pre-analytical problems really interfere with our assays. I will be giving you some uh, cases so that you can work out the answer. At the same time, I will discuss with you how to overcome the problem that we see. The total testing process comprises of the pre-analytical phase, the analytical phase, and the post-analytical phase. The pre-analytical phase include the test request, patient identification and patient preparation, specimen collection, specimen identification and labeling, specimen transport and storage, receiving of your sample or the specimen at the laboratory counter and sample processing. So why are we so particular about this pre-analytical phase and the pre-analytical errors? Because most laboratory errors, nearly 60% is 
in an automated laboratory are attributed to pre-analytical phase. So these pre-analytical errors are sometimes patient related. Sometimes they are sample related. Patient related causes include medications given to your patient, the diet taken by the patient, biological variations, and improper patient preparation, for an example, inadequate fasting or over fasting. Sample related factors include hemolysis, which is thought to be the commonest interfering factor, lipemia of the sample, trace proteins or presence of paraproteins, icteric samples, that is trace bilirubin in the sample, improper sample collection, improper sample container, improper sample transport and storage. Most of our laboratory assays are colorimetric. So that means we measure a color that is developed by the test reaction. Electrolytes are measured by ion selective electrodes. Immunological methods are used for tumor markers and hormone analysis. Chromatographic methods are used for HbA1c. Electrophoresis is used for serum protein electrophoresis and glycated hemoglobin assays. Since the commonest method that we used in biochemical testing process is colorimetric methods. I will show you briefly what happened in a colorimetric method. So that is known as the quid. So that is the container or the vessel that contain the sample and the reagent. Then what happened? A reaction between the sample and the reagent happens, and that creates a color. Your analyzer has a source of light which generate lights, and these beams of light traverses the quet and reach the detector. And the color that is generated by the test reaction absorb some of this light. And therefore, the intensity of color, intensity of light that is reaching the detector is reduced. And the degree of reduction of the intensity of light is proportionate to the concentration of the analyte. So this is the basic principle of a colorimetric method. Hemolysis, as I mentioned, is the commonest interfering factor in the pre-analytical phase. Hemolysis sometimes releases intracellular analytes into the plasma. And that can falsely increase potassium, phosphate, LDH, and AST. Sometimes hemolysis releases fluids diluting the plasma so that you get falsely low results. For an example, falsely low, low results for your glucose and calcium. Hemolysis releases hemoglobin, which has a color. So in colorimetric methods, I mentioned that light is absorbed. And we assume that the color in that reaction cell is purely due to the reaction itself. But in the presence of hemoglobin, what happened? You have an additional process. You have an additional process making a color that is releasing hemoglobin. So what happened? You can get falsely increase certain analytes. For an example, false high results for serum bilirubin in hemolyzed samples. 
sometimes intracellular agents, intracellular chemicals that are released into the plasma participate in the test reaction. The best example is adenylate kinase participate in the test reaction for creatine kinase, giving a falsely high result for creatine kinase in hemolyzed samples. Sometimes intracellular proteases, enzymes, are released and they degrade the analyte of interest, particularly the uh, peptide analytes like insulin and ACTH, leading to falsely low analyte values. We generally obtain venous blood for testing. But even that venous blood contain some amount of oxyhemoglobin. And this oxyhemoglobin contain oxygen which can oxidize us our analyte of interest. One of the examples for this phenomena is bilirubin. So hemolyzed samples can cause falsely low bilirubin due to oxyhemoglobin oxidizing and destroying bilirubin. Contain a color from the beginning that is due to bilirubin. And in the reaction, what will happen is bilirubin And the color intensity is reduced. And the degree of light that is absorbed is also reduced. So this can cause falsely low results. The best, best example is bilirubin negatively interfering with your serum, creatinine acid. Lipemia and increased proteins in the sample can cause scattering of light, reducing the amount of light reaching the detector. Right? These lipemic and protein molecules, they are large molecules. So when the beam of light hits them in the sample, they are scattered. And the amount of light, the intensity of light reaching the detector is low. As I mentioned earlier, we assume that the decreased intensity of light reaching the detector, we assume, is purely due to the absorption. But here you can see there is an additional process that decreases the intensity of light reaching the detector. So this is how your lipemia and increased proteins interfere with your test assays. So you can have falsely low serum amylase levels in lipemic samples. Electrolyte exclusion effect is another way by which lipemia and increased proteins interfere with your assays. Now here what happened, you can see that in your specimen, in your sample, you have a separate lipid layer from the water compartment. And your lipid layer doesn't accommodate electrolytes. It is the water compartment that accommodates your electrolytes. Right? So your electrolytes are concentrated there and the lipid layer is divided of them. So it is this reason that leads to falsely low sodium values in lipemic samples. The same thing can happen with increased proteins. When the sample is lipemic, what happened? The fat soluble analytes can get dissolved in this fat. And this also can cause either falsely high or falsely low values. The basic example is steroid hormones. Most of the steroid hormones are 
fat soluble and you will see them partition in the in the lipid layer of the sample right i will show you some cases and i will give you few seconds for you to think and come to a conclusion before i tell you the answer right here is a biochemistry report of a patient given to you without a proper history you can see that your sodium is low potassium is high and it is implausible 12.8 chloride is within normal ast is normal and your glucose value is low right i will give you a few seconds to think and come to a conclusion okay how many of you think it is hemolysis obviously this is no hemolysis because your ast ast remains normal so this is less likely to be due to hemolysis so this was a whole blood sample which was stored in the refrigerator what happened is that the low temperature in the refrigerator inhibit sodium potassium atps enzyme so that your potassium leaked out into the plasma and your cells utilizes glucose and your glucose is falsely low so this is an improperly stored sample so what we recommend is if you are going for serum test you have to separate cells from serum and it is the serum that should be stored in other words you should not store whole blood if you happen to transport a sample a blood sample from one hospital to another make sure that you centrifuge it and separate your serum and it should be the separated serum transporting from one center to the other if you are looking at a serum test case number 2 a neonate with a rash i will give you few seconds to come to a conclusion okay you can see that this rash is basically perioral you can see this rash is around the nasal orifices it is around the oral orifice it is around the anus so if you see a rash like this it is more likely acrodermatitis enteropathica which is a sink deficiency syndrome and this neonate was treated with sink local applications and the response was poor and the clinicians wanted to confirm the diagnosis with serum sink acid and that is the result so you can see that serum sink is high not just high it is implausibly high in a patient in whom we expect a low serum sink level i will give you few seconds to work out the answer i told you that this patient was treated with sink local applications and this very high implausibly high sink level was due to contamination and another sample was obtaining following proper cleaning of the skin and look at the sink level it is low in keeping with your 
clinical diagnosis of in, uh, acrodermatitis enteropathica. The common contaminants include surgical spirit, which is used to clean your skin, which can give you a false positive test for alcohol. Betadine or povidone iodine. If get contaminated with CSF, it mimic CSF xanthochromasia. Impurities in recycled tubes can cause spurious results with your iron, calcium, and phosphate acids. Coming to case number three. An 82-year-old woman with acute diverticulitis and her baseline creatinine, which was assayed using Jaffe's method, was 97 micromoles per liter, which was within normal range for that patient. Right. A little bit of the Jaffe's method. It is the commonest method used in biochemistry labs for creatinine assays. And patient was given kefiron, 2 grams, 12 hourly intravenous infusion, having monitoring her renal functions. On second day, post treatment, her serum creatinine I said, using the same method, Jaffe's method, was 327. So it has gone up from the baseline value of 97 up to 327. And look at the urea level, which is normal. And look at the clinical picture. No clinical evidence of acute renal injury. So I will give you a few seconds to work out the answer. There was a suspicion of interference with creatinine assay, which was repeated using enzymatic creatinine, which came as 98, which was within the normal reference range. I mentioned about the Jaffe's method, which is the commonest method, which is a chief method, but the problem with this method is that Jaffe's react with non-creatinine chemicals as well. Examples include cephalosporin antibiotics. In contrast to your Jaffe's method, your enzymatic creatinine, your enzymes are more specific for the creatinine assay. These methods are a bit expensive, but they are more specific and they are not interfered by they are not interfered by non-creatinine Jaffe's reactants. So this was due to cephalosporins used in this patient interfering with the Jaffe's creatinine method. The clue here was the enzymatic creatinine remained within normal and there was no evidence of acute renal injury and your urea remained normal throughout. There are many drugs affecting laboratory tests. Many antihypertensive drugs and diuretics interfere with aldosterone renin ratio. So these drugs should be stopped before doing a aldosterone renin ratio. Prednisolone and hydrocortisone positively interfere with your cortisol assay. So this is why we recommend dexamethasone for the suppression test rather than prednisolone and hydrocortisones. 
then your blood pressure will have to receptor blood pressure. Foods increase chromogranin assay. So you are supposed to stop these drugs at least for 14 days before doing chromogranin test. Levodopa interfere with your urine VMA test and your innocent paracetamol also can interfere with certain assays like 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid. So how to address medications affecting laboratory test results? If possible, you omit the drug before taking samples. You can use alternative drugs that are known not to interfere with the test. If you can't any of these, then you can obtain the blood sample immediately before the next dose so that the plasma level of your drug level is minimum and the chance of interference is less. The other option is you do the test on a different platform. You do it using a different method that is known to be free from those interferences. Coming to case number four. A 68-year-old male on statin therapy for hypercholesterolemia. The compliance of this patient was good. And this is the lipid results that we obtained from this patient. You can see total cholesterol is 319, very high. And your LDL level remained high. And your HDL is at 118, that is also very high. What are your thoughts? I will give you a few seconds to come to a conclusion before I myself giving you the answer. Right, on further investigations, we found that this patient has consumed curry liu kanji. Right, that is Karapincha Kola Kanda. Karapincha Kanda. Karapincha Kole, known to contain sterols, which probably interfere with serum cholesterol assay. I don't have any scientific literature to prove this, but this is what we observe in our day to day practice. People who consume Kari Liu Kanji they have implausibly high cholesterol results. And this is no genuine increase of cholesterol. That is an interference due to sterols in curry leaves. What are the diets affecting laboratory test results? Caffeine in coffee, tea and cola drinks interfere with the urine VMA, caffeine, bananas interfere with your urine metanephrines, red meat can give a false test for your occult blood in feces, dietary proteins can give a falsely high urea level and a vegetarian diet can alkaline your urine. Coming to case number five. A 44 year old Australian female was brought to the medical legal department following an alleged sexual assault. And her blood alcohol level was zero. But the urine contained alcohol at 150 milligrams per deciliter. Right. I will give you a few seconds to think about this. Think what are the possibilities here. Okay. One of the possibilities is delayed presentation. Patient has cleared alcohol from his blood, from her blood. But urine still contain alcohol. 
So delayed presentation. Other possibility is that your blood sample actually contain alcohol, but it diffuses out due to improperly sealed container or due to metabolism by microorganisms. So these are the possibilities for a positive urine alcohol test with a negative blood alcohol. For the investigations, confirm that the chain of custody was maintained and the blood sample was analyzed immediately, whereas the urine sample was analyzed as a routine one. For the inquiry, confirm that this patient was from a group home where there was no access to alcohol and her breath and her breath did not smell alcohol and she gave a history of diabetes. I will give you a few seconds to work out the answer. Think a little bit and get the answer. Right, I believe all of you know how alcohol is made. Alcohol is made by fermentation of glucose or sugar by yeast. And this patient is diabetic. And she had glycosuria, which was fermented by yeast, which is a common commensal in the female urethra. And this was due to neoformation of ethanol during storage of the sample and new formation of analytes are seen with uh, urine alcohol. And also, new formation of cyanide is seen in putrefied bodies. So you might think that the patient died of cyanide poisoning, but actually that positive cyanide is due to the process of putrefaction. Coming to Case number six. Right. You can see a implausible potassium result. Sodium remains normal. Chloride remains normal. Albumin normal. And calcium is low. And I think it is implausibly low. And alkaline phosphatase is also low. Right. Work out the answer from your mind. How many of you think it is hemolysis? Obviously, it is not hemolysis. Hemolysis can cause falsely low calcium, but not up to this degree. Hemolysis can cause falsely low alkaline phosphatase, but again, not up to this degree. So this was due to the sample obtained into an EDTA tube. What happened is your EDTA precipitated calcium. So it's falsely low. <laughs> and you can see that your EDTA is a potassium salt. It's potassium EDTA. So your potassium level is falsely high. And alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme that needs 
magnesium as a cofactor. So magnesium is also precipitated by EDTA. So you get falsely low alkaline phosphatase, falsely low calcium, and implausibly high potassium level in EDTA contaminations. Coming to case number seven, go through the results and work out the answer. I will give you a few seconds. Okay, you have a very low sodium level. I think this is implausible. It is not compatible with life. Potassium over 10, implausible and incompatible with life. Chloride is very low. Bicarbonate is low. Urea is low. Creatinine, slightly low. Protein, albumin, all low. Look at the glucose level, it's very high. Right, glucose level is very high, but urine for reducing agents is negative. What do you think this was due to? This was due to a drip pump. The drip was going on and the nurse has taken the sample from the same site. What do you think the drip contained? It contains potassium and it contains glucose. Right. That is a serum protein electrophoresis report. That is the densitometric curve. You can see that your beta 2 is raised. That is the band. You can see there is an abnormal band there representing beta 2. It's not in the gamma, it's in the beta region. And this really worries the chemical pathologist because sometimes the para proteins appear in the beta 2 region. Right? They do not necessarily appear in gamma region only. They might appear in the beta area. So when we see that, we really get scared. So what is the next step? Think of the answer before I tell you it. I will give you a few seconds. What is the next step here? The next step here is immunofixation, which was done with IgG, IgA, and IgM, and also for your kappa and lambda. So as you can see that there is no corresponding band with any of these, right? That is the suspicious band, the monoclonal band that we thought, but there is no corresponding band in your immunofixation. So we know that it is no immunoglobulin. It is no para protein. So we suspected fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, it appears in the beta 2 region and it mimics a para protein. So further investigations with immunofixation doing with anti fibrinogen antibodies confirm that there is a corresponding band for fibrinogen, right? There is no corresponding band for your gamma, for your IgG, IgA, IgM, kappa and lambda, but there is for fibrinogen. 
So we know that we know that this is due to fibrinogen. So the take home message here is that you should never send us plasma for serum protein electrophoresis. Serum protein electrophoresis should always be done on serum, which is divided of fibrinogen. Fibrinogen can mimic monoclonal bands. Coming to case number nine. I have already given you the diagnosis, a patient with cirrhosis. Bilirubin is elevated. Albumin is low, ALT is elevated, urea is normal, and your creatinine is low. Your creatinine is low. What do you think this is due to? Work out your answer before I show it to you. I mentioned that bilirubin negatively interfere with creatinine assays. So this low creatinine is due to that high bilirubin. So remember, if the patient is having hyperbilirubinemia, your creatinine results might be low and your urea is more reliable than creatinine when the patient is having high bilirubin levels. Coming to case number 10. A 66 year old male with multiple myeloma. You know the diagnosis, it's a multiple myeloma. Sodium remains normal, potassium remains normal, urea is normal and creatinine is also normal. Bilirubin is elevated. Your protein levels are high, that is quite expected in a patient with myeloma. Your albumin is low, again expected finding in a myeloma, and your liver functions remain normal and LDH high, that is compatible with myeloma. Right, let's start from the beginning. Patient with myeloma, you see this biochemistry results. Which results do you think is implausible? Which results do you think that you should not believe? Which results? Work out the answer from your mind. Right. It is the bilirubin results that you can't believe. Now you already know that high bilirubin negatively interferes with your creatinine, which you don't see here, right? Your creatinine is compatible with your urea, urea right? So these two results tally with each other. So you know that creatinine has not been negatively interfered by that elevated bilirubin. With that, you know that this bilirubin is not genuine. This is falsely high bilirubin. That is due to paraproteins. So paraproteins can positively interfere with your bilirubin acid. Spurious test results due to paraprotein interferences are seen with bilirubin, with creatinine, phosphate, electrolytes, and even with lipid profile. Coming to the last case, 31-year-old woman with type 1 diabetes. Your sodium level is low, potassium normal, chloride is normal, and your glucose is under control. Right. Now, if your sodium is low, 
generally your chloride also remains low unless there is a additional uh, acid base disorder right so normally your chloride follows your sodium so you know that there's something wrong with your sodium acid what do you think is giving false results for your sodium think of the answer. i will give you a few seconds <clears throat> Right. You know that this patient is diabetic. Lipemia can cause pseudo hyponatremia, falsely low results. So how do you confirm this? What is the next investigation you would do to confirm that this is not true hyponatremia but pseudo hyponatremia? Work out the answer before I show you the answer. If your sodium is genuinely low, your osmolality is also low. But pseudo hyponatremia, your osmolality remains normal. So pseudo hyponatremia is caused by increased lipids and also by increased proteins. These patients are clinically normal. Their serum osmolality is normal. And if you measure sodium using ISD. So we talk about pre-analytical errors. We talk about some cases. Now let's see what are the facilities about to analytical problems. The newer auto analysis generate the epidemic in as it tells us the degree of hemolysis, the degree of terus, the degree of lipemia. And depending on the index, we decide whether to release the results or not. For an example, if the hemolytic index is two, I will release the sodium result, but I will not release the potassium result. We can use different reagents. The reagents that are known not to interfere with the particular agents. We can use different methods which are not interfered by pre-analytical factors. Kinetic assays is where you get the measurement while the reaction is on. It's not an endpoint reading, right? So these methods also can use to overcome some of the reactions. Bichromatic assays where you take the absorbers at two wavelengths, and this also can overcome certain assay problems. With lipemic samples, we can use chemicals to clear the lipemia. Yeah. So this chemical is known as lipoclear. So these are the uh, options we have in an advanced laboratory to tackle the pre-analytical problems. So in summary, pre-analytical errors is the main cause of spurious laboratory test results. But they can be tackled successfully by proper patient preparation, proper sample collection and transport and storage and using newer laboratory techniques which are available nowadays. These are my references and thank you very much. If you have any questions, it's the time to ask. I think there are some questions in the... Yes, Tushar, you can... Uh, yeah, it's a Q&A. 
Could you please uh, answer them? Yeah. Uh, commonly uh, available uh, after yeah. Sri Lanka uh, Jaffe's method. If that's so, which uh, cephalosporin affect uh, most of this method? Which cephalosporin? Well, all the cephalosporins are known to interfere with this method. Right? All the cephalosporins, cephalexin, cephalexone, cefuroxin, any of these cephalosporins can interfere with your test. How long should you stop iron tablets before stool occult blood? Of course, you don't have to stop iron tablets. Iron tablets do not interfere with your test. It is red meat. Right? Because your occult blood feces occult blood test that is based on peroxidase activity of hemoglobin. It's not based on iron. It's based on the peroxidase activity of your hemoglobin. So if you have hemoglobin, whether it is coming from the patient or coming from an animal, your test doesn't recognize. So you have to stop red meat for three days before collecting stools. And you don't have to worry about iron tablet. Right. The next question is, can uh, diabetic nephropathy cause, uh, sorry, uh, the diabetic cause. nephropathy cause urine BJP to be positive even without uh, monoclonal gammopathy? Uh, yes. Benzose proteins are not due to paraproteins. It's due to immunoglobulins. So if you have a tubular pathy, you lose your immunoglobulin. And that immunoglobulin in urine can cause a positive test for bench jones. So it's possible. Right. The next question is uh, uh, send plasma cortisol. How long hydrocortisone uh, should be omitted? Uh, uh, to be honest, I can't remember the T half of this drug, right? So I suggest you to refer to literature and find out the answer for how long you have to stop your hydrocortisone before uh, standing for cortisol, right? Okay, the next test is uh, case 8. You said uh, send serum, not plasma. What? Tube uh, blood should be sent for serum protein electrophoresis. It's a plain tube. It should be a plain tube so that your blood will make a clot. When the blood make a clot, your fibrinogen is utilized. So it's no longer in serum. And there's no way your fibrinogen coming and interfering with our assay. Right? So use a plain tube and never use EDTA tube. Right. The other question. Uh, when bilirubin is high, what should we do to uh, get uh, correct creatinine levels? Uh, well, I mentioned that uh, there are two methods for creatinine assay, the enzymatic and Jaffe's method. And Jaffe's method is more affected by bilirubin than the enzymatic method, right? So if you have enzymatic method, go for enzymatic method, but still bilirubin negatively interfere with the assay, right? So if you have hyperbilirubinemia, you have to go for a different method like HPLC or mass spec, which is not available in Sri Lanka. So what I suggest is you keep in your mind that your creatinine may be falsely low. So when you do your creatinine in a hyperbilirubinemic patient, do your urea also and get an idea. Right. What is the other question? Uh, high sensitive troponin positive despite uh, ECG changes, right? Uh, how uh, 
reliable is our test. Uh, I can understand what he's asking. Uh, right. Can you? I think he's yeah. asking to share without ECG changes. When the patient yeah. comes to chest pain, troponin is positive. We consider it is non STEMI. Now, high sensitivity troponin is different than normal troponin IOT. So, he is yeah. asking whether it, it should be uh, more than the five times cutoff value yeah. or just a uh, level. Uh, well, troponin, troponin has a cutoff value given, right? For high sensitive troponin, the values are different. Right, the normal troponin we have a one value cutoff value and a high sensitive troponin there's a different value, right? Uh, our value at, at, at Tandra Agupur, our value is uh, if it is hundred and above hundred nanograms per liter and above we take it as positive. Below sixteen we consider it as negative, and sixteen to hundred we consider it as borderline. And yeah. Uh, routine or the ordinary troponin it has a different cutoff value so you cannot interpret your high sensitive troponin value using the uh, cutoff value that is set for ordinary troponin right any more questions uh, the one, no? the one, no? yeah this okay uh, yeah. right that's a uh, suggestion i think that's a very good uh, suggestion to do a study okay. right so, so this is a common observation that we come across patient consume curry leaf kanji and they believe that it will reduce the cholesterol levels but we when we test it what we see is very high cholesterol levels. But I could not find at least a single article confirming that curry leaves positively interfere with our test assay. So I think it is a very good uh, research point. Yeah, actually that uh, uh, Dr. Tusharani can uh, discuss with uh, Dr. Heva Gigan and <laughs> do a study later on. Really go more to the other questions. There are another three or four. Uh, what the other question? Can you explain about st storage of CSF samples? What CSF sample samples? No, CSF should not be stored. Right? CSF should not be stored because the cells easily get lysed. Right? Within two hours, your white cells get lysed. Right, you will not see anything thereafter. Therefore, CSF should not be stored, it should be analyzed immediately. And on the other hand, uh, somebody who undergo uh, lumbar puncture for CSF collection is in critical conditions, so we can't store it, it should be analyzed immediately. Uh, Tushara, sometimes for the viral studies and all, we might keep uh, CSF sample. Uh, refrigerated that i think that is the reason right. they're asking that not for the full report. okay right okay right so uh that of course depend on the test that you do for certain tests uh, you might need to keep it in at uh, minus 20. for an example this <laughs> auto antibodies uh, nmrd antibodies they recommend it's not a viral thing it's auto antibody they recommend uh, to store at minus 20. Okay, so there's another one. When serum yeah. free light chain assay is negative, do we need to be serum protein electrophoresis? What is that? SPEP. Yeah, that is electrophoresis. Uh, yeah, what is this question? I can't understand when the. Uh, I can't see it on the chat box. No. When serum free light chain assay is negative, yeah. Do we need to do electrophoresis? Serum light chain is negative. Uh, yes, because 
light chain myeloma is one entity and inter yeah. intact myeloma is another entity. I think we do it in the uh, other way around. We do the electrophoresis first. If it is negative, we go for the light chain assay. If yeah, we... It is the other way. But th this what this person is asking is, if light chain assay is negative, whether there is a chance of a myeloma. Yes, still there is a chance of a myeloma. Because there is an entity called intact myeloma and there is another entity called light chain myeloma. They are two different entities. So electrophoresis will pick up that intact myeloma. Uh, the other one is how to calculate sodium levels in extreme glucose levels. Pseudo hyponatremia. Uh, it is not a calculation. Right, what is this? It is pseudo hyponatremia. You do an osmolality. If the osmolality is normal, that means you are dealing with pseudo hyponatremia. The other option is you check with the lab whether they have what you call the direct ISC, direct ion selective electrode method. This direct ion selective electrode method will not cause pseudo hyponatremia with lipemic and hyperproteinemic samples. The problem comes with indirect ISCs. Okay. Right? So, so my answer is, if there's hyponatremia, don't try to calculate it, right? Just find out whether you can do osmolality and whether you can do a electrolyte assay using direct ISC. Uh, next question is the same one, that's paraprotein thing. Vila, other one is, what is the reliability of hemoglobin, sodium and calcium level analyzed by ABG machines? Arterial blood gas machines, hemoglobin, calcium, and what is the other one? Sodium. Sodium, right. Well, these are standardized analyzers, right? So they are standardized and their values have been compared with laboratory-based analyzers. So they are reliable. The last one, sir, what are the causes which cause false platelet levels? All platelet levels, it of course depends on how did you analyze. If you analyze it on an auto analyzer, right? Uh, if uh, platelet clumps are not read by the auto analyzer, platelet clumps, auto analyzer will read as a white cell, right? So that is a reason for low platelet count, falsely low platelet count uh, when you analyze it on an auto analyzer. Right. Okay, so what I recommend is, yeah, what I recommend is if the auto analyzer platelet value is low, you ask the lab to do a manual manual count. Right? Because the manual count, the MLT see the platelet plumb and he can count it. Thank you very much, Tushar, Dr. Tushar Heva Gigana, for that very interesting case-based discussion. And uh, looking at the questions. Uh, we can understand how it's important for the, all the listeners. Uh, so it was very comprehensive uh, talk. Thank you very much again. And uh, this time I would like to take this opportunity to thank our president, Dr. Kumuduni Jai Singh, for giving her guidance. Actually, Dr. Suranga Manilgam, president-elect, is the one who suggested this topic, which is a timely topic. Thank you, Suranga, for that. And uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Dishan Fernando, with our IT support and gets Pharma for sponsoring this event. And thank you all very much, all of you, our virtual participants. Without you, it won't be a fruitful thing. So we will meet up in next uh, August Senior Registrar Forum. Thank you very much. Have a very good night. <laughs>